So, hello everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, we'll just start in two minutes. Um, first, I will take a recap of week one and week two, especially the assignments. If anybody has a problem with week one and week two assignment, we can first discuss that. And then we can move on to week three content in the course, as well as like I have some questions prepared. So we will discuss those. Also, um, for those of you who have only joined in for the first time, if you look at the Zoom chat, there is a link to the Google shared folder where I have been uploading the weekly class notes and slides from my TA sessions. If you want to get the notes for the previous sessions, you can get it from that. I'm just posting it once again. I think I think continuous chat is enabled, so you should be able to see previous messages. But I put the link in the chat for um, anyone who's not seen it before. So <clears throat> the video links and this shared Zoom link, both are there on this Vyam portal now. There is, um, I think there is, the, uh, in the left hand menu at the bottom, there's a link which says problem solving session Jan 2024. So you can refer to that. Okay, I think it's time we can start. So anybody has any questions, you can first ask me your questions if you want. You can type it into the chat box or you can just unmute and speak. So any questions from week one and week two assignments? Anything which I discussed in the class or anything um, from the, you know, the NPTEL assignments, which you have to complete weekly. Okay, week one, question three. Let me open week one, question three. Okay. Yes, so what is your question in week one, question three? Okay, you want me to explain. So, uh, if everybody can open the assignment, week one, question three, Robert can choose from two types of fruits from a basket containing oranges and watermelons. He chooses watermelons of these two. So let me just write it on the board. Just give me a few minutes. Let me just log in from my iPad also. Okay, so now what we have in the problem is let's write it down instead of just reading it. So he can choose, there are, he's choosing between two fruits at one time, right? So in the first instance, he has to choose between oranges and watermelons and he chooses watermelons. So... Mm 
the you know the happiness the utility value he derives from watermelons is greater than oranges right now when given a choice between oranges and grapes he chooses oranges so but when given a choice between grapes and watermelons he chooses grapes right now if you combine 1 and 2 this should give you watermelon is greater than oranges is greater than grapes right that is what we call as a rational choice or you are consistent you can't say i like a better than b and i like b better than c but i also like c better than a that in in the subjective world when you're talking about people say suppose you know maybe human beings can be a little bit irrational but in economics we call that kind of behavior as irrational behavior right what we have outlined in this equation this is what we call as rational behavior or rational choice or we can call it i mean rational is the term we use most commonly in the world of economics in consumer theory but what we are saying it is it is is that it is consistent um you know consistency in the choice so what can we say about robert with the given information that's the question so is robert rational in his choice he is not because in the third case he is choosing grapes over oranges in between grapes and oranges he is choosing grapes right so this grapes and oranges thing this is an anomaly in a way it is not a rational choice so what he is doing is breaking a pattern right a greater than b b greater than c implies a greater than c right but in his case what he is doing is he is doing c is greater than a which means you're going around in circle like that which means you can never actually predict what robert is going to choose right this is a this is b this is c is going around in a circle like this right so when somebody makes a choice like that we cannot say anything about what they will choose between uh, you know different items so this is only a b c now if you introduce another third item here d can you say what he is going to choose we can't really say we don't know where d is in the circle for example even if you know d about something about d as compared to a or as compared to b we still don't know anything exactly about whether he is still going to prefer d in a certain pattern right so which is why his choice is not rational right therefore let me write the whole thing and only when you have some rational behavior you can actually say something about um you know you can actually predict something about what a person is going to do in a certain situation therefore you cannot sorry cannot predict anything about his behavior okay so this is um like uh, the basic rationale behind it um i don't no i don't think uh, if you will study consumer theory and preferences in that much detail but i know that you will probably study this again in consumer theory not sure if it's included in a whole lot of detail but this is the basic answer it means right which question this is we one question 3 right okay so um 
asking explain price ceiling and price floor okay i'll come to that let me go in a sequence so which other question was this uh, question week 2 question 1 3 and 8 question 1 3 and 9 so nothing else from week 1 right i can move on to week 2 then ma'am ma'am i have a question sorry i have a question regarding this point Uh, this this explanation yes yes please go ahead i understand the answer i gave the answer you got your voice is actually not coming very clearly so yeah can you repeat what you said am i audible i'm you are audible but your voice is very muffled so i'm not able to make out what you're saying properly just speak a bit slowly yeah Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I gave the response that he is not eligible. Did you understand how we should say that he is not eligible? So the David is that he. Why do we say that he is not what? Sorry, your voice is very. It's not clear. That's the problem. Yeah. can you hear me some somebody is saying that you can't they can't hear me so uh, can just one, one minute your can voice everybody... is clear ma'am your voice is clear okay fine thank you um, so now uh, i don't know who was asking the question yeah sanjeev ji i think right so can you just type in your question once again because your voice is not coming clearly so okay this has been locked out this happens all the time yeah Can you just type in your question? I'll just reshare the screen. Yes, you understand that he is not rational. Then, answer is all of the above because he is neither rational nor consistent. Nor can you explain anything about his behavior or predict anything about his behavior from what is given. And that is exactly what I was explaining as to. why you can't explain right when only when somebody has a rational choice can you actually uh, explain and understand their behavior you're getting me if you say yeah i like if you say i like monday i like mondays today and i like monday better than wednesday and i uh, sorry let's go the other way around say suppose you say i like sunday better than saturday and i like saturday better than friday and then you say i like friday better than sunday are you making sense you're not going to make sense to any for any normal people you may have your own reasons but you know it's not going to make a lot of sense which is why he we are saying that they are not consistent this is um it's a bit difficult to understand when you are looking at people in a you know a very subjective way but the whole purpose of economics is to quantify things it is to objectify things i mean you may not like it but then that is what the whole world of economics is about so in economics the problem we face is we cannot study that behavior we can only study a behavior if it is following a certain pattern if they are consistent in their choices or if you can predict something about their choices if you cannot predict something about somebody's choice you cannot study their behavior you cannot understand what their demand is going to be you don't know what they will choose tomorrow right if there are five goods in the market you don't know which good they are going to choose out of that if you don't know what the relationship between each good is you should be able to define um can you hear me now i don't know why i got disconnected some issue with the internet yes you are clear and audible okay thank you so um i think some people are waiting so was the answer clear i had explained the answer for rational behavior question 1 a uh, week 1 question 3 so i'll uh, any other questions from week 1 any other questions from week 1 if there are no questions from week 1 um we'll move on to week 2 so week 2 One second. Just need the whiteboard. Right. Okay. Let's go to week two. So week two, 
uh so by the way week 2 i think um, the assignment solutions posted are kind of wrong so um, you know please don't worry about that uh, it, it's just a a wrong uh, solution set which has been uploaded so you're asking something about welfare okay can you type in your question uh, i'll i'll answer it let me just see what the week 2 questions are if they are related to welfare then i'll answer your question while answering that question itself okay week 2 just saying question arti ma'am or mohit sir ma'am it is yes yes go ahead ma'am this is uh, i just ma'am this is actually related to the week 3 the question is is okay. in week 3 but it has got a mention in week 2 when we talked about welfare the welfare we were talking about the uh, consumer surplus and the supplier surplus now what right. happens when the tax is imposed so what will be the welfare ma'am i will come to that let me come to week 3 we are still on week 2 so we haven't discussed anything about taxes so far so just wait we'll have to wait a bit if you are familiar with what we are discussing you can log in in a few minutes but let me first go step by step for people who are who still have doubts with week 2 and i'll answer them first then we'll come to week 3 okay so let me once again go no, back to no, what no. the question was um one minute which questions can you just type in which questions it was uh, i don't have it in the chat somebody had asked a question i'm not seeing the questions in the chat i think it was 3 is the person still on online week 2 they had asked some question was it question 3 yes, and 9 yes, yeah can you just type into the chat again it's not there in the zoom chat i, I lost the chat i try to send you the thing your name the thing you are not in the meeting okay you are really not audible i was just saying that because i got disconnected that part of the zoom chat has gone so that's why i'm not reading what you wrote in the chat earlier okay yes. let me just go to question number 3 3 right okay suppose there are 100 identical firms in the rag industry and each firm is willing to supply 10 rags at any price the market supply curve will be so uh, okay so last time i had mentioned that this last part you know and robert can information you can ignore that part because that part is kind of just uh, garbage text by mistake it has gotten pasted over there so you don't have to worry about that part okay and uh, uh, no I, i have the question i was just asking which question numbers you wanted to ask so yeah. anybody who wants to ask questions your voice is not clear that is why i'm asking you to just type it into the chat box so that i know uh, which i can just read it basically question yes 1 3 and 9 One, three, and nine. Okay, for week two. Okay, okay. Thank you. So week uh, two. Question one is: If the price of automobiles were to increase substantially, the supply curve for automobiles would most likely do what? So what happens? Uh, uh, okay, this is a basic question about shifts uh, of the curve versus moving along the curve, right? so what ha- what is the difference between the two Be- between shifting the curve supply curve and moving along the curve let me just draw the diagram uh, sorry so just in case i get disconnected again uh, if, if there's some issue with the internet please just stay online i'll take a few minutes and then the internet will be back and then i'll i'll come back online it may be a overload the thing because i log in from two places but i can't really help it so oops oops sorry not this okay let's go to question week 2 question 1 okay so now we are talking about the supply curve so suppose we take a very generic curve just straight line curve right this is your q this is your p as usual p is on the y axis and supply is generally 
upward sloping now i know these are not strictly straight lines but just bear with me because even though i'm an artist i'm actually not great at drawing straight lines so okay, let's assume this is a straight line this is a demand curve demand and supply now when price changes what are you essentially doing what is the supply curve essentially telling us what is the purpose of the supply curve in the first place it gives us a relation between price and quantity supplied right there is some equation maybe ps is equal to a minus b q s something like that right it could be the other way around or i think maybe i've mentioned it wrong let's say q s is equal to a plus b p something like that right this is an equation say suppose of the supply curve now if p is changing is this equation changing no the equation will remain the same for different values of p you just get different values of q s right Q S as per the equation or supply curve. This is the important part. Equation is not changing with change in price alone. If only the price is changing, equation is not changing. So the curve is not going to change, right? If A is changing, for example, on the other hand, or if you add something else, let me write in some other color. So say suppose you change A. Say suppose you change A, or you add something T, some value T. Then what happens? Then by altering, by altering other factors, your equation is changing, or your function is changing. so for the same price you will get a different qs right now let me take a very simple example like just made up value i'm just making it up on the spot so so don't uh, like you know go to don't get to attach to it now in this equation say suppose this is the supply equation for say your automobiles or something like that if p is equal to 100 you get qs Is equal to, say, suppose two hundred and five, right? Now, if I'm changing P, say, suppose it is fifty, QS is equal to hundred and five. So you're getting different values. Now, if I add something else to this, instead of, you know, this equation, I have two P plus some value T, where, for discussion, say, say, suppose T is equal to ten. Then, if P is equal to hundred, implies Q S is equal to five plus two P plus ten, right? Is it the same? It's two hundred and fifteen now. So now you understand the difference between moving the curve and shifting the curve. In this case, in this equation, we are not moving along the curve. We are shifting the curve. and how are we shifting the curve for the same price quantity is more right so if this was say suppose or even you can look at don't necessarily have to look at equilibrium price say suppose this is p is 50 this is say suppose p is 100 now what is happening for the same p is equal to 100 you are getting a higher quantity right so for the same p 100 you are getting some greater quantity right this was 205 now you are getting 215 so similarly you will be getting other quantities and the supply curve has shifted something like this I'll try to make it more parallel something like this so this is a shift to the curve this is not moving along the curve but when price is changing you are moving along the curve this is a very fundamental idea so i hope uh, it is clear now so when you have other factors in this case i have added something right so it is shifting right towards if i subtract something it will shift left towards 
So, and if I change the coefficient of p, like here, I'm just taking plus 2p. But if I change it to 4p for some reason, then the curve is going to change in slope. It's going to move upward or downward depending on how I'm changing it, right? If I change the coefficient, it's going to be something like, maybe something like this, right? Then the slope is different. Now, we are not talking about any of these scenarios. We are just saying that the price of automobile is changing and quantity is changing based on that. So we are, there's no change to the curve. So always think whenever <laughs> you're given a scenario in front of you and you find it confusing, always see, is the equation changing? Is the supply equation or the demand equation? Is the equation, the basic function, is the function changing? If the function is changing, then the curve is always going to shift. That's how you understand it. And this is important. Somebody was asking me about tax. So even in taxes, you don't have to memorize these things. If you understand this basic idea, you will not have a problem with understanding taxes. Now here I've put T. This T could just as well be some sort of a tax, right? So it may be a tax, it may be a subsidy. So I'm not saying that uh, it is a certain type of tax, but it could be some type of a tax, right? So... What happens in these cases is that the function, as in the supply or demand curve itself is shifting. Whereas if you're only changing prices, prices to change hote rehte hai, right? Like prices always keep going up and down. That is the reason why we have the given equations, whatever we have. Because those equations basically tell you the relation between quantity and price. Okay, so question one, I have answered. Question three, you suppose there are hundred identical firms and each firm is supplying 10, 10 rags. I don't know what industry this is, <laughs> but they are supplying 10 rags at any price. The market supply curve will be what? So hundred identical firms and each firm is supplying 10 rags at any price. So what is the significance of knowing that it is at any price? Because you remember market supply or market demand is horizontal summation of each individual demand or individual supply, right? But if that supply or demand changes with price, then we have to take care that we are only summing up the demand and supply for, price, um, for prices for which the demand is actually greater than zero. Right. So in this case, we are told that they are supplying the same quantity for any price. Right. So what happens in this case? Let's suppose this is the firm's uh, plot and this is the market demand. This is not demand, sorry, supply. Okay, Q, P, Q, P. Now each firm we are told is supplying what? 10 at any price. So <clears throat> what are they doing basically? Quantity is fixed, right? Quantity is fixed. Say suppose this is 10. If price is changing, is this value changing? It's not. So it's going to be what? It's going to be a vertical line. And this is, let's say, small Q is for firm. QS is equal to 10 is the demand, oh, sorry, the supply function. This is the supply function. Now, if you take the market supply is what? Horizontal summation. Of each firm's supply. Provided the supply is greater than zero at the price range we're looking at. Right, so now in this case, we know that for each firm, the QS is equal to 10 is the same function. That's what we are told. So then we can always sum it. It's just summation. QS is equal to summation QS is equal to what, 100 into 10 is equal to 1000. And since 
each firm is not changing their supply. So the market supply is also not going to change. Market supply is QS is equal to 1000. Now this is a vertical line, so it's going to be a vertical. That's the answer. That, um, yeah, it's a vertical line with capital Q equal to 1000. Okay, next go to question number nine. Mm, minimum price plug. Somebody had asked about price ceiling and price floors. So, um, okay, so is there a specific question or is there a specific problem you wanted answered about price ceiling and price floors? Is like, if you can just tell me what exactly is tr troubling you. Somebody had asked, I don't have the chat, so I can't see who asked this, but somebody had asked about price ceiling and price floors. Okay, and somebody said week two, question two, you got wrong. So are you like, are you clear on the answer now or you want some explanation? No, I still feel, uh, I mean, I don't know where I am getting it wrong. Okay, you don't know why you are wrong. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, okay, let me come back to week two, question two. We've already started. Or let me do question two only first because we'll come to price ceiling and price floors after that. This is not actually much to explain here. So increase in price of good Y increases supply for good X. Increase in price of good Y decreases demand for good X. Okay, and the, this is da, 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 da. all right. So the basic question they're asking is: Are they substitutes or complements in terms of demand or in terms of supply? Now I had explained this actually last time. You have to first be clear on what it means for something to be a supplement and something to be a, a sorry, not supplement, complement, and something to be a substitute in terms of demand and in terms of supply. Now, what in terms of demand, it is a bit straightforward, right? Now, if I'm sort of like, you know, buying this, again, let's go back to apples and oranges. So suppose I'm trying to choose between apples and oranges, right? And I like apples and oranges almost the same. To me, it's the same thing. Whether I eat apples or oranges is a very slight difference, but I'm almost indifferent between eating apples versus oranges. Now, if apples are what I'm eating now, say suppose, and price of oranges increases, will that increase my consumption of apples or decrease? It will increase, right? Because now oranges are not giving me enough, um, you know, enough satisfaction because my marginal value for both is the same, but the price of oranges is more. So obviously I'm going to go for apples. So I get more surplus out of it. You, you understand what I'm saying? No, from consumer's perspective, if the, if the, the marginal value is for, are the same for orange and apple, then price of orange will, uh, increase in price of orange will increase in the consumption of apple. Yes. That is, I mean, that is from consumer side, but then, Yes, I'm coming to supply side. I'm talking about demand side right now. I'm just giving you the definition right now. You're clear on the definition, right? Yes, yes. So that is substitute. Yes. yes. In terms of complements, it means that, say, suppose you have uh, something like sugar and milk, which go into tea, or you can take tea and sugar or tea and milk, right? Now, if I like making tea or if I like making coffee and the price of sugar increases, right? Sugar is one of the components of tea, the final tea which we make. I'm not talking about tea leaves. So say suppose we look at sugar and tea leaves, right? If price of sugar increases, what happens? I'm consuming less of tea, which means I have lesser demand for tea leaves. What will I do with those excess tea leaves if I'm not drinking that much tea, right? So these are two complements, meaning increase in price of one, basically decreases the demand for the other also. Okay. This is right. in terms of demand increasing, side. 
decreasing the price of one is leading to uh, decrease in demand of one and the uh, one and two are tied together so consumption of two will also come down that is why yes. both are complements yes let me finish the explanation then i will come to your question okay now coming to uh, supply side right now in supply side it's a bit tricky because you have to apply a slightly different kind of logic you have to think from the point of view of the firm right for a firm say suppose i gave like i gave the example last time of uh, sewing machines right and i think professor vimal gave the example of boeing making uh, military airplanes versus uh, commercial uh, airplane commercial aircraft right now if i have to choose between which two if i'm getting the same kind of you know profit same kind of thing between the two i will manufacture both but say suppose the market price of military aircraft increases what will i do i will allocate my space and my resources to manufacturing military aircraft and i will allocate less of my resources to um, commercial aircraft right so increase in price of military aircraft is reducing my supply of commercial aircraft right so i'm substituting out of um, commercial into military so this is the substitutes from the supply side is this clear increase in supply of increase Not in supply. price of increase in price of military aircraft is decreasing the supply of commercial aircraft yes that's why you understand are... that yes 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 any problem in this or you got you understood this no i i understand this okay yes so now in complements you have something like again you know something like say suppose there are um there is a machine and then there is a gear which goes into the machine like there is a shell of a machine and then there is a gear which goes into the machine right now if the yeah. price of the machine increases and i am manufacturing both right for me both the goods are um manufactured by the same same uh, company it can actually even be a different company but just for simplicity sake now say suppose the price of the uh, gear uh, increases right what will i do i will make more of the machine parts also not just the gear right why because you are selling both together what will i do with just selling the gear you will be selling the rest of the machine also right if if uh, the price of one is increasing then obviously you will want to supply more of the other thing which goes along with it also so you will increase the supply of the complement good that is complement from supply okay. now so let's look at the question the question says uh first is uh, now now are you able to answer it now or you still have a problem so what i gather is like uh increase in price of y leads to increase on, in supply of x that means increase on supply of y is not bringing down the uh, uh, demand for y rather it remains as it is and you don't have to move both you are mixing the two both when you are looking at demand you look only at demand when you are looking at supply you look only at supply okay so okay okay i got it now because you can't mix both positively sloped i got it now because price supply curve is positively sloped so, so price increase will lead to more supply of y yes leading supply of y is increasing and x is also increasing that is why now i got it thanks yes. okay so next uh, i have already answered question 3 somebody was asking something else price ceiling and price floor right one minute let me just read what they have written uh concept of price ceiling and price floor in sub in context of minimum support price please explain price floor and what happens to the demand and supply curve um minimum support price i i don't think we discussed it in the lectures but it's basically the same thing as price floor right so uh i don't understand what exactly your question is but i'll just solve the example i mean the question we had in the assignment i think that should um solve the problem i have gotten logged out again from my ipad so just give me a moment
Okay. Am I visible? I'm not seeing anything in my Zoom. I don't know where. Okay. All right, let's just move to this. So you don't have to memorize any of these things. Okay, although all these concepts are new, so you may feel like, you know, you have to think about uh, what goes where and all that, blah, blah. But you don't have to actually memorize any of these things. Just think it's basic common sense, especially undergrad micro is really just a lot of common sense. Just think, you know, take everyday examples and then try to reason it out in a systematic manner. Don't try to mix everything together. Usually that is the mistake which uh, most people make in the beginning part where you start varying everything because you start imagining all the possible scenarios that can happen. Don't vary everything. Just see what the question is asking. If What is changing? Is demand changing or is supply changing or are both changing? Which is a shock to what? So go step by step and try to, as far as possible, write the equations and draw the diagram if you're, not, if you're still not clear. Like if you're not being able to reason in your head, try to write an equation, a typical equation, say suppose, and try to see what will happen. Will you are you adding something? Are you subtracting something? Is the equation changing? Is the curve changing? That is generally what is what at least I find very helpful in these kind of um, things. And it's not just at undergrad, even at higher level, that is what's helpful. Okay, let's go to the question. Question number nine is actually the last part, I think, in a series of questions. Let me see what is the first question. And so this is the demand and supply curves. Is the screen visible? Okay. So this is the, the What D minus P and SP is equal to 10 plus P. All right. So you have solved all the other parts. I'm assuming last part is what you're worried about. Okay. So the government wants to make sure that only 20 hustles are bought, but it does not want the firms in the industry to receive more than the minimum price that it would take to have them supply 20 throstles. Okay, one, one way to do this is for the government to issue 20 ration coupons. Then in order to buy a throstle, a consumer would need to present a ration coupon along with the necessary amount of money for the good. If the ration coupons were freely bought and sold in the open market, what would be the equilibrium price of these coupons? So I think these coupons uh, idea is kind of... Um, you know, you, what is confusing you? Is, is that correct? That you're not familiar with the whole idea concept of coupons. So coupons is nothing like, you know, if you go to a fair or if you go to a food court, um, you know, instead of paying the, the, the teller or the person at the counter directly, you give, you give them the money and they give you a coupon, right? And sometimes you can buy a coupon for more money also or less money or whatever. But in that uh, entire food court, you can use those coupons, right? So you use that if some item is for 100 rupees, instead of paying them 100 rupees at the shop, you just give them a 100 rupee coupon. So it is basically the equivalent. It is this, almost the same thing as giving them that much money. It is just that when they're issuing coupons, by issuing coupons, what they can do, they can regulate. Meaning they can control how many coupons they're issuing, meaning... If they issue, if say suppose one coupon is 100 rupees, right? And the they know that they do not want more than, um, say, 50 units of that particular item sold, right? So what they will do, they will issue, they can count the number of coupons, right? So they will issue only 50 coupons for that particular item. 
is this is this making sense are you able to understand what i'm saying you can just type in the chat box who had asked the question you are not clear okay how do i explain this is uh, uh, have you ever bought food in a food court by the way has anybody bought food in a food court yes right so in nowadays i think they have actually changed that system but in many places in food courts you don't pay the shop directly you have to pay them a coupon but the coupon has that same price as what the item will be so if you want to buy some item for 100 rupees you give them a 100 rupee coupon instead of giving them 100 rupees so basically the price will be the same the price is not changing is that is that making sense is this much making sense the price you give with the coupon versus the price you would have given otherwise is the same all that we are doing in um, you know in, in this kind of a setup is like with food coupons or something like that is that the government or you know central authorities i suppose the mall itself wants to change or you know something like that. somebody wants to control how many items are sold they can issue only a certain number of coupons so they have a count of how many coupons are being sold right after 50 coupons they will stop they will not issue any more coupons so that way yes, we are just controlling like, just like in uh, uh, movie theaters for a particular price of uh, uh, price range there are limited, certain number of seats yes so the moment the seats are over with the booking for those that price range is over yes exactly it's like But a that, ticket correct similar to a ticket but in this case uh, like you know in a in a theater you know how many are there right in this case you can change that quantity you can determine that quantity as per the conditions as per what you want to how you want to alter the market right in a theater you know how many seats are there the seats are fixed so it is an external constraint right but in the coupons it is not necessarily because of shortage of quantity it is because we want to control how much of the quantity is being sold or transacted in the market so then instead of 50 we can make it 100 we can make it 120 it's up to yes, us yes this dynamic correct yes so that is it's a mechanism it is a way for the government or any other basic uh, controlling central uh, agency to control the quantity otherwise how will you control the quantity you can't monitor you can't control in many ways no just think about it from the basic mechanics of it it's difficult controlling quantity yes, as correct. a central today, authority today, is today, difficult today if i have a sense like if i have this much of stock so i will uh, convert that stock in those many coupons each coupon will have uh, uh, i mean this coupon is worth for say 500 grams of say food grain or something like that so basis that we can uh, availability of stock we can distribute the number of coupons yes so uh, i i didn't fully understand what you said but i think what, what you said was correct um just give me a moment i think i'm logged out again so now at least you understand the meaning of coupons right what we are doing with coupons we're not doing anything new in over here all we are doing is we are just controlling the quantity and in this question let's come back to the question uh if the ration coupons were freely bought and sold what would be the equilibrium price of the coupons so what we are trying to say so i'm going to connect the ipad otherwise i can't draw okay fine so let's share the screen yes so what we basically want to know is equilibrium price we are not asking for anything <laughs> different here we have controlled the quantity we are going for equilibrium price what is the quantity the the <clears throat> government wants to make sure that only 20 trusses are bought right so q uh, let's say q prime prime actually implies differential so q bar is 20 okay and do not want the firms in the industry to receive more than the minimum price it would take blah 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 20 ration coupons ration coupons were, so basically what we are doing is we have decided that equilibrium quantity cannot be more than 20 right 
so we will have q equals to 20 one minute somebody is posting something on the chat um q one minute let me see the question uh, yes i think mm -hmm. you have got it right but move it so basically what we are doing is that in um, from the supply angle we have basically fixed the quantity at 20 right and in this equation you just instead of normally you would write q1 you create q2 d right but in this case we don't need to do that what we're trying to do is we're trying to find that price at which you will sell those 20 fossils okay i don't know who makes these questions but i don't know why they had to pick throstle why not tomatoes or something <laughs> Also, is a very technical term, I mean. Anyway, so let's put 20 here. 20 is equal to 10 plus P, which gives you like, you know, 20 we have put instead of Q. Q bar is 20. It implies P bar is equal to 10. So if they are issuing coupons, only 20 coupons for throstles, the price for those coupons would then be 10. Right? We have fixed the um, we have fixed the quantity which is supplied. Okay. Which, see, in this case, what we are doing is we are not looking at the equilibrium quantity. That is what I think uh, is um, got you people confused. That uh, normally what we do to find the price and the quantity is we look at the equilibrium price and we look at the equilibrium quantity and the normal equilibrium without any external effects, any regulations. Equilibrium quantity and prices the same, right? So in this case, that is not happening because we have inserted a regulation by limiting the supply. And now see, we're not altering the curve. Again, I wanted to emphasize this fact, there is no shock to the supply here. We are not changing the supply function. All we are doing is we are putting a cap that more than 20 is not allowed to be traded into the market. And in that in that process, now see, if we, if we limit the, um, if we limit the quantity, then generally what happens, price is going to change. If in the equilibrium setting, price is going to change, right? If you put that same value of um, 20, say, suppose in the, <clears throat> in the demand equation, you will get a different value, right? You will not get 10. So obviously, obviously we are not looking at an equilibrium price and quantity here. What that is why they have explained that the government wants the <laughs> wants the firms to get minimum price that it would take <clears throat> because this is given by the supply function. So now mm, we put this value in the equation and we get the prices 10. Is this is this clear? Any other questions? Okay, I was it's become a bit big, but okay, let's keep it like this. Okay, can I move on to week three now? No more questions. So week two is done, right? No other questions from week two. Okay, great. So, um, one minute. Let me share my questions from week three. But before I do that, let's go to uh, your questions. Is there any question you guys have which you want me to answer from week three? Any questions? No. Okay. So then it's almost an hour. So I'll take a 10, 15 minute break. Let's do a 10 minute break. And then we'll continue with week three. In the meantime, in that break, <clears throat> I want you to solve this question. The market demand function, the one you have on the screen now, the screen is shared. Please solve this question in in the break and then I will come back and we will discuss price elasticity of demand. So I will be back in 10 minutes. So you don't have to, you don't have to 
drop off. Just take this time to <coughs> calculate this answer.
Okay, so I think you had enough time to solve it. Any questions? What is the answer? You can just type it into the chat box. Anyone who solved it? Yes, yes, if you have solved it, just type your answer into the chat box. Anyone, everyone who has solved it? Okay, some people have solved it. Okay, so what is the process? What is defined as price elasticity of demand? That's the first question. Does anybody want to answer? So, we, I think in one lecture, Professor Vimal has explained this in a lot of detail where he has explained why um, we do what we do in this particular case. I just want to give a moment for everybody to answer the question. Yes, so, I mean, elasticity like how the two things behave with price and quantity with the change in uh, price how is the behavior of quantity so uh, if, price, okay. if price is moving up and quantity is moving down so uh, i mean it it leads to like with the change in price your voice is breaking is changing. There are three, with change in price, the quantity is also changing, and there could be three uh, uh, scenarios. Now, no, I'll uh, come to the, the scenarios lecture. later. Uh, hang on, you have not got it completely right. So, what you are talking about is uh, simply change in price versus change in quantity, but that is not what we are talking not about. That is what I want price, to emphasize. The, the yes, just just wait, just wait. Language. Yes, now you are coming to the correct answer because the two things are not the same. That is exactly what I wanted to uh, get out of the discussion. So, uh, one minute, let me share it from my iPad. So, there is a difference between change in price and change in quantity versus, um, you know, proportional change in price and proportional change in quantity. And I think he spent quite a fair bit of time explaining the two. So, uh, let me see if I can share. So, uh, one, I think, I don't know who was speaking, one person at least I think was answering it almost correctly. But I'm not sure if everybody has understood this part. See, what we are talking about in terms of um, <laughs> change in price versus change in quantity, there are a few things to understand here. First of all, we're talking about price elasticity, okay? There can be many other elasticities of demand we're not talking about supply right now so we are talking only about um, demand and we're talking about price elasticity that's just a mental note because the same logic the same whole approach is going to apply for all other elasticities also so there are other elasticities also uh, i don't remember exactly if it is discussed in the lecture or not but you can have income elasticity you can have cross price elasticity you can have different values but basic principle you need to understand first of all so what somebody else said, I think on chat also and otherwise also, is that it is change in quantity versus change in price. Now, this could be a, a way to measure, um, you know, how much quantity is changing with, changing, with change in uh, price, but there is a problem with this calculation. And I would have spent a lot of time discussing this, but I think... Uh, 
we don't have that much time remaining. So I will just give away the answer over here. The problem is that this is in some unit, measured in some unit. And this is measured in some unit. So suppose I'm measuring this in dollars and I'm measuring quantity in tons, right? Now instead of tons, if I change this from tons to, say suppose I change this to pounds, and from dollar, say suppose I change this to rupees. What happens? Price elasticity of demand is going to change. And we have done, have we done anything new? We've not done anything new. We've just taken delta Q and delta P. Same delta Q and same delta P. All we have done is we have changed the units in which we are measuring. So say suppose it is two tons. We've just calculated whatever it is in pounds. And say suppose it is $10. We just calculated whatever this is in rupees, right? We've not actually changed the, the quantities and the prices. We've just said that, say, suppose delta Q is two tons and delta P is $10. We have expressed the same thing in pounds and rupees, but this value is going to change. That is the reason why we do not take it as delta Q and delta P. Is this clear so far? Why we are not going with this? unit, yeah, why we're not going this with this expression for measuring. Let's keep it this way. Okay, I'm assuming it is clear because nobody said anything. Now we normally use this small epsilon um, for as for denoting price elasticity of demand. And what we do is to fix this problem of units, which take this as proportional change. And this Q and this P here is just um, denoting original quantity and original price. Okay, now there was a whole discussion about taking average of Q and Q plus delta Q and all that, but and it's really not that relevant, especially since most of the times we are going to be working with continuous functions and we are going to be um, using calculus most of the time. So that discussion becomes quite irrelevant because and then in that case, um, you know, you're just taking a differential and a quantity anyway. So instead of worrying about all those discussions, for now we can just focus on this. So this is in, you know, general terms, what price elasticity of demand is. In calculus terms, we take it as dq by dp into P by Q. So you can just take this P up and take this Q down and this is what you get. Right? So this is the expression for price elasticity of demand. Okay. Now in this, you have to, uh, this is kind of assumed, but this is understood, but I'm still spelling it out. This applies, this calculus stuff applies. It's not working like this. this calculus stuff applies only if you're continuous, if only if your function is continuous. If you are given a linear equation or some other equation, if it is expressed as a continuous function, only then you can use this. If you are given a table with values of P and Q, or if you are um, given something like a step function, like you remember in the last two classes I discussed actually, I, we had taken two tables with marginal valuation and price and marginal cost and price and things like that. So this expression cannot be used in, <coughs> in those kind of scenarios because they are not continuous functions. Okay. Fortunately for us, most of the functions we use are going to be continuous functions. So we can use this. So now I think the problem is relatively simple. Let's go to the problem now. Now we know the function given to us, uh, we know Q is equal to A minus BP. So what is DQ by DP minus B, right? Epsilon is equal to what? DQ by DP into P by Q minus B into P. What is Q? A minus BP. Okay, now if I take this minus inside, what do I get? BP upon BP minus A. 
Now, if you put plug in the values I've given for B and A and P, you will get the answer um, minus one by five. Is this clear to everybody? How I got this answer? Any problems? I think some people had some other answers, but hopefully this has clarified um, the confusion. So he, uh, in the lecture, he had mentioned that uh, when we are doing this elasticity, we have to put one uh, negative sign in front of that. So that is subjective. Many times you will be required to report it in terms of... Um, so he has said that it is not a hard and fast rule. And many times we especially require it to be reported as negative because uh, it shows that an increase in price causes a decrease in quantity. In any case, that is why you have this multiple choice answer. Are you seeing any option with plus one by five as the price elasticity? That no, is, right? That is why I had chosen none yes, of them. Yes, so that but... is what I am saying, that if you have to choose the best possible answer here, they have not specified what convention they are following in this question. And this is from a book. This is not my made up question, by the way. So this is the convention which is followed in many places. And it is important that you understand that sometimes they use that minus, sometimes they don't. If you are writing, um, so if this question you should have asked when I was explaining what is price elasticity. <laughs> One minute. Let me just write that formula again. Epsilon is equal to dq by dp into p by q. Now, if you put a minus in front of this, then you will not get a minus. But that is not how we generally do it. There are both ways. Sometimes we do it like this. We just want to bother about the uh, about the magnitude. We assume that it is, you know, it is a normal good, and that is why increase in price is going to decrease the quantity. So we assume that it is going to be negative, and therefore we put a negative in front. So because we already know that this is implying something negative, but this may not always be the case. For the case of some types of goods, quantity, price, quantity, demand function may not be like this. It may be something different, which is why this convention is not always followed this negative sign in the front. And uh, I, like, you know, for because maybe this is undergrad level, so that is why he said that you can use it. But you should get used to both the ideas. The fact remains that this minus one by five is not wrong. Okay, that is what I wanted to emphasize. That if you are seeing that the answer, this BP upon BP minus A has a negative hidden inside it. Right? You understand what I'm saying? It's not that we have messed up the calculation. This BP upon BP minus A has a negative hidden inside it because BP is less than A. Right? So that is why when you plug in the values, you will get this answer, minus 1 by 5. So uh, this is a question I have actually taken from uh, workouts in intermediate microeconomics. And this is the correct answer in the book as well, which is why I wanted to take this question to illustrate that if you get a value like this, um, why isn't it annotating? Yeah. If you get a value like this with a minus, you should understand that that is the convention being followed because this is not like technically wrong or something. It is just a matter of what convention you're following, right? This is not algebra. And this is not like your typical arithmetic where minus two and two, there is a, like, you know, there's an earth shattering difference between the two here. It's a convention, whether we are wanting to follow that convention or not. So it is not like if you put a minus, it's wrong. If the price, if you have something like an inferior good, and if you have an equation, something like uh, Q is equal to A plus BP. And then in that case, you put some other value and you get something. Then if you put a negative there, then it is wrong. But here, all we are trying to do is we are trying to capture the idea that it is actually negative. That quantity is decreasing with increase in price. Okay, now um, next move on to the next question. <laughs> this is a different function. Now, I'll just mute myself for three minutes. Just solve this question and then we'll come back to this question and we will discuss what, uh, what is the correct answer.
Okay, so this is not very difficult if you understood what I had explained. So let's go with the calculus part first. dq by dp is equal to minus 2 into 14 into p to the power of minus 3, right? Or I think this, is this clear for everybody? Are you able to read what I have written? Okay, somebody has answered. Only one person has answered in the chat. Others also, please post your answers in the chat. If this is not clear, I will write on the iPad. Uh, are you able to read what I'm writing on this? Just type in yes or no. Okay, somebody else has answered. Great. Okay, then I'll write it here only. So I will share these uh, annotated slides also. Okay. Um, what is epsilon? Epsilon we already discussed is, oops, sorry. It's less space. Okay, wait, let me write it there. Okay. Just thought it's easier to write with the question. Okay, this is question two. So Q is equal to So if you are not comfortable with calculus, I would recommend that you get comfortable with calculus because it's not just about this course, but in general in economics, you will need a lot, lot of calculus. So if you really like economics, you're really excited about doing more of economics, just take some time, go over, different, especially differential calculus, integral calculus, if you know it is enough, um, like, you know, it's not a do or die thing, but differential calculus, definitely you will need to know for, for economics. So epsilon is dq by dp into p by q, right? Minus 8t p to the power of minus 3 into p upon q is what? 40 <coughs> p to the power of minus 2. So this becomes minus 2, 40 and 80. And p to the power of minus 3 into p is p to the power of minus 2. So you have p to the power of minus 2 in the numerator and denominator. So that gets cancelled out. What you're left with is minus 2. Is this clear to everybody how I got this minus 2? So this is your answer. This is your price elasticity of demand and as you can see it is constant right this is like one of the special functions where you get a constant what i mean by constant is with change in price quantity is of course changing but it is changing in the same proportion which means that price elasticity of demand is constant Quantity and price are not constant, but the rate at which they are both changing is constant. And this is like, I mean, it's a special function in that sense, because it's a quadratic function, negative quadratic function, uh, in which you get this constant value in, in the answer. Right? So now, of course, you can calculate. So if it is constant, it means what? Obviously, for all prices, it's going to be the same. So again, I'm following that same convention here and um, we are using a negative sign. And in this, again, you can see that the function itself is defined in such a way that when you solve it, you will get a negative sign, right? We're not, uh, we're not messing with the calculation anyway. It is just how <clears throat> we have followed the convention. Okay, let's not spend more time on this. I think everybody is, uh -huh, what is wrong now? Can you see? No, you can't see the file, right? Don't understand what the hell is the problem. Shit. Let me share the screen from here. Okay, now this is a very interesting question. What do you think is 
which one do you think is more elastic? So we got a function for price elasticity of demand for corn and we got a constant value for price elasticity of demand for rice, right? Now what we are asking is which one is more elastic? More elastic means which one the, what does more elastic mean? Just making sure everybody is on the same page. What does more elastic mean? You can type in your answers in the chat. More elastic means what? Remember the rubber band? Example he gave. If something is more elastic means it's changing a lot more for the same amount of force you're applying. Is wood elastic? No, right? It's inelastic. No matter how much you stretch a strip of wood, it's not going to increase in length. Yeah, I know higher value of elasticity. I mean, what is happening when the higher value of elasticity? Meaning quantity will change a lot more for the same increase in price. If something is more elastic, you will have higher numerical value. Let's be clear about that. We're talking about numerical value, okay? Not, not the sign. Forget about the sign for now. So in calculations, the sign is going to matter. And you have to follow the same convention in calculations. You cannot do this that in one calculation, you use the convention of putting a minus before it and in another, you don't. You can't do that. You have to follow the same convention, when, especially in this, which is why I wanted to take this example. So you can... Um, uh, you can compare the two only when you follow the convention in the same way in both the examples, right? So um, when I say more elastic meaning higher value of elasticity meaning change in quantity is more for the same change in price. Now let's see what did we get. Oh, my screen is not shared. Okay, one minute. I don't know why. I think it's the issue with the internet, which is why I keep getting locked out again and again. Login again. Or maybe it is just the stupid iPad problem. Well, it's a pity we have to waste time on waiting for me to log in every time, but there's nothing I can do about it for the time being. Okay. Mm. Are you able to see my screen? No. Let me start it again. Now I think you can see. All right. So let's go with there's a lad, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> You're not able to see my screen, right? Yeah, there's some issue with the screen sharing. The thing is, there is no simpler equivalent to doing this. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm guessing you can see it now. Let me put the two values we calculated. So in epsilon one, we calculated for corn as uh, BP upon BP minus A, right? And epsilon two, we calculated as minus two. Okay. You can see it now, right? All the people, everyone. So let's assume these values. We can just rewrite the equation instead of these values. B, P, so that becomes P. 
BP minus A, right? P minus 60, that is the, that is the equation given, right? Just checking. B is equal to one, right? Yes. So now, now what do you think? For, can we say something about the two elasticities, which one is greater, which one is not as great Again, point to note, you can see that it is P minus 60, right? So, okay, I'm giving away the answer, I think, here. So, what do we do? How do we compare these two? Any ideas? I just want to give a moment to everybody to think, because if I just give away the answer, you know the answer, but I want to help you understand how to think about these type of problems. The question is, which one is more elastic? Is corn more elastic? Is rice more elastic? Or is there some other relationship? Or is it <coughs> is it indeterminate? Okay, so since nobody is answering, what we will do is, what we are checking is whether epsilon 2 is greater than epsilon 1, right? Or is it the other way around? It could be either way, but... Okay, let's do this. What you want to know is, is epsilon 2 is greater than epsilon 1. So, we write epsilon 2 greater than epsilon 1. And we check if this condition is true or not. Epsilon 2 is for rice. This is for corn. In case you have forgotten which is which. I'm already written this. Let's remove this. So right now we're not talking about price. Now what we, what we want to do is we want to check if this condition is true always or not, right? Or is, is false always or not. It could be either. It could be possible that epsilon 2 is always greater than epsilon 1 or epsilon 2 is always less. We'll find out when we check this. Now what is this minus 2? Is it always greater than P upon P minus 60? Say suppose we assume that this is true, then what do we get? P Thus, when 20 is greater than P, which means 3P is less than 120, which means P is less than 40. Which means what? We got the condition for which epsilon 2 is greater than epsilon 1. Right? Are you following me? So, meaning for price less than 40, Price of what? Price of corn. We're talking about price of corn because price for the uh, elasticity for rice, it is independent of price, right? So only the price of corn is figuring into the equation. So for any price of corn less than 40, what are you getting? We're getting that epsilon 2 meaning rice is more elastic. See, you have to understand that the elasticity of corn, price elasticity of demand for corn is changing with different values of P. It's not constant. For rice, it is constant. For corn, it is changing. And if you remember, um, if you remember the diagram Professor Vimal drew in class was something like this. So even if you have a straight line, you know, here to here with the same given equation, say suppose Q is equal to A minus BP, the, uh, you know, the slope is the same, slope is the same, slope is dq by dp, but there is a point here where epsilon is equal to 1, and above that and below that, the elasticity is different. It is greater than 1 or it is less than 1, or basically what we are trying to say is that elasticity is changing along the curve, right? So that means that what we have arrived at over here is just the condition for which um, the price elasticity of demand for corn is less than that of corn. If price is greater than 40, that means corn at, in that price range, corn becomes more elastic than rice. Is this clear? It's not, um, it's not very complicated. Just We're just trying to test our understanding of price elasticity. Okay, can I move on to the next question? Oh, it's, so it's a problem with one drive. It's not a problem with... Okay, let me share the question from here. Okay, 
now this is just a general question it kind of connects with what we just uh, discussed which of the following statements is true so you can type in your answer into the chat box just read it carefully and then see what you think is the correct answer the conceptual questions there's not a whole lot of calculation here i'm just giving you 2 minutes to think and type the answer Okay, so I think two people have answered. Okay, now this is exactly where I was uh, in the previous question where I made that diagram. Remember, epsilon equal to one in the middle of the curve, and epsilon greater than one, less than one. Okay, let me share this. This is the basic nuisance I am facing again and again. If I have to draw anything, I have to. log in from here do you want me to explain this or can i move on to the next question we can come to taxes if you don't need me to explain this i can't hear you somebody was saying something mm could you repeat what you said i i couldn't explain okay you want me to explain it okay okay then let me share my screen <clears throat> okay Okay so this is exactly where I was Okay most people want it explained somebody doesn't want it explained so i am going to explain i'll just explain very quickly and if you don't if you're not sure of it we will come back to it later okay question 4 this is the diagram q p at some point here it may it need not be the midpoint by the way just a point of observation i have seen a lot of times that visually it looks like you know it's it's uh, greater than uh, it's like the midpoint of the line but it need not be the midpoint of the line so at this point what happens total revenue is what t into q okay and what we are saying is that at epsilon equal to 1 the, the very way it is defined is such that um you know at um so, so wait a minute let me write down what is epsilon okay so the way we have defined epsilon is is like this dq by dp into p by q now you can put a minus there if you want you don't have to put it if you don't want but basically what we are saying is that at epsilon equal to 
what happens is that if you change the price, quantity changes in the same proportion. If you change the price, quantity changes in the same proportion. So what happens? Total revenue does not change. Right? Just understand it that in this situation, delta TR is equal to zero because a change in quantity and change in price are both changing in this. One is increasing, the other is decreasing. And in, in that situation, what we have is delta TR is equal to zero. Right? Um, I know you can explain it diagrammatically. I'm just for the moment trying to remember how to explain it. Right. So P, this is Q, this is um was, this is P into Q and this is P naught into Q naught. Okay. And this is equal to the same. Can you see the diagram that there's a rectangle? which with P and Q as its two sides, this rectangle, and there is a blue rectangle, P naught and Q naught. So what we are trying to say is that this increase and this decrease in revenue are canceled out because of the way the function is defined and the way the function is changing at that point at that point where epsilon is equal to zero, uh, is equal to one. Okay, now you can see here, this whole white rectangle is P into Q, right? That's the, uh, that's the, you can say that's the total revenue. And this blue rectangle with the blue sides is P naught into Q naught, which is after change. Now this is the extra you are gaining here, the change in price and quantity. There's some additional, revenue from change extra in price and there is some loss in revenue this from decrease in quantity right what we are saying is that in for the case of epsilon equal to one this and this become equal so what happens total revenue does not change at that point at that point okay now <clears throat> in other cases above this you can see what's going to happen let me let me use some other color above this point, above this point, if I change, if I change, what is happening? This is the gain. And uh, let's use some other color. See, suppose we're talking about this point, yeah, this pink point dot from here that green box is the increase and this whole pink box this pink hatches this whole box is the decrease so now you can see my diagram is not perfect but still you can make out that the increase is very small that green box is small and the decrease is that pink hatched box which is very big so net what happens it decreases right so this is the point at which it is going to decrease total revenue is going to decrease for increase in p that is what the question is asking so if epsilon equal to uh, if epsilon is less than 1 what happens Price increases total, uh, um, sorry, yeah, it's the, what I'm explaining is the opposite. I'm talking about the decrease actually. So if epsilon is equal to one, if it's greater than one, if P increases, total revenue is going to decrease, right? It's not going, it's not going to increase. And this is the region where epsilon is greater than one. You can take some other color and you can mark this region. So suppose this point, mm, I take some, only so many colors I can take. So suppose this point, here epsilon is uh, less than one, right? I didn't get it the other way around, right? 
Yes. So now you can see uh, diagrammatically. I mean, if you want, you can compute it and you can see which is going to be where. It's going to take a little bit of time and we only have 15 minutes left. That's why I'm not going into the detail. But if you compute the value of epsilon at this point, you will see it will come out to be greater than one. And here it will be less than one. And you can see diagrammatically why this total revenue loss is happening. Okay, let's go to the next question. Now, um, so this, okay, I don't know if you can see the slides. Can you see the slides? Yeah, okay, now it's true. All right, so you can solve, um, I'll, I'll upload the solutions also if you like for this question. Now in question five, we'll go over this. It will take a little bit more than 15 minutes, but I'll, I want to go over it properly because I don't want to rush. So it may take a little bit after eight. If you want, you can stay back. Consider a mineral which is fixed in supply, QS equal to four, and the demand is given by this function, 10 minus two P. Now, a government imposes a tax of two uh, per pound on the consumer. Okay, two per pound, all right. Okay, so this equilibrium quantity, can you calculate? Just quickly calculate the equilibrium uh, price and quantity. I'm just muting myself, okay, before the, before the imposition of tax. Did everyone get this? I'm just going a little bit fast for the equilibrium part because it's, I think, hopefully it is simple. Now, um, let's go to this part. What is the equilibrium quantity after tax is imposed? Right? Uh, equilibrium quantity after tax is imposed. And who is paying the tax now? Consumer is paying the tax. Right now, again, I'm muting myself. Just give yourself two minutes. Just think about the question. Okay, don't start writing until you have first spent some time thinking about the question.
right so somebody posted the answer this part is kind of simple <clears throat> so i'm actually just solving it i've also not solved this question i didn't get enough time to solve it uh, one more second this part uh, only one person has solved anybody else right so uh, i think nobody has answered well so see the quantity supplied is 4 right that is fixed it's not a function of price at all so will imposition of tax change the quantity supplied it will not right is this part clear to everybody actually i think uh, some of you may be confused because it says 2 dollar per pound but if this is i solved the question both ways but i think the uh it, you can take it as a unit tax it's not per pound okay take it as just two dollar not per pound this, this is a mistake in the question or there is a mistake in the answer because if you take it as per pound you will not get the right answer and you will not get any answer <laughs> i think i think because i solved it both ways in the few minutes when i was muted and i think you were not so P is going to be per pound. The P is always per pound, right? P is always in terms of per unit of quantity. So, but when we say two dollar per pound, it means per unit of quantity, which is not what is happening here. That I'm just clarifying in case you are confused. But if you're not confused, then it's okay. You can uh, assume that this is two dollar as a fixed or a unit tax it is not a proportionate tax okay so assuming that this is a fixed or a proportionate uh, sorry it's a fixed or a unit tax uh, we will come to the other part later but the quantity supplied is equal to 4 it is fixed and quantity demanded is 10 minus 2p right now in equilibrium in the case of taxes price paid by consumer and um, supplier is not the same because one side is kind of you know, bearing the incidence is kind of uh, paying a different amount or getting a different amount. But the quantity will be same in equilibrium. Okay, if it's not an equilibrium thing, then something can happen. But in equilibrium, QS equal to QD and QS we already know is 4. So quantity is always going to be 4. Right, moving to, on to the next question. This is the more interesting part. What is the price received by a producer? after taxes this is an important question i mean this is the interesting part this is the part which you have to basically solve so um let me share this screen now Yeah, I still have to log in again. I'm logged out once again. I have to log in. I have to give hosting permission. Then I have to share screen. Okay, let's start. Okay, so let's keep it till here. Okay, now I have already solved it just for the sake of time. I think it should not, 
take too long for us to explain this now. Now, price paced by consumer is, I took this as T into Q, but it's not T into Q. We're solving it as just P plus T. So what we are saying is that if price paid by supplier is P, which is the price, uh, you know, we normally take, PC, the price paid by consumer is something extra, right? PC is equal to P plus T, which is the tax we have added. T here is where T is equal to two. <clears throat> right, this much is clear to everybody that PS and PC are going to be different. PC is P plus T, PS is equal to P. Now QS we know is four, QD is what? The equation for QD was 10 minus two P. Now instead of two P, this becomes two PC. Right, this is, ouch, sorry, not this. This becomes 2PC instead of 2P, right? Now, what is this 2PC? This is, of course, P plus 2. You just plug in the value P plus 2. What you get is this same. Uh, I've already done the calculation. Just writing it in a more neat way. You get the answer. Let me solve this properly. I think this is a bit ugly. But you have the answer basically. No, this, okay, sorry, I have mixed up two parts of it. I did it in an untidy way. I was trying to solve very, very fast. QD is equal to 4, right? QD is equal to QS is equal to 4. So this is 20 is equal to 10. No, I'm still getting it wrong. What the hell is wrong? Why am I getting it wrong? I just solved it, right? What did I delete? Sorry, I just solved it and I got it right. I don't know why I'm suddenly getting it all wrong. Okay, QD. Yeah, because I was mixing the calculations. 10 minus 4 minus 2P. This is 4. This is 6. Minus 2p. 2p is equal to 2. p is equal to 1. Sorry, please ignore the first part. I had mixed the two answers. And uh, yeah, I had just. No, no, I, I had. It was not that I was taking it as 20. I was solving the case for when the tax is p plus 2q. That is why half the calculations were in that way. And anyway, forget about that. You just what is just follow what's on the screen now. You just take QD is equal to QS. Let me write this in annotations here. Four. So you just plug in the values, right? QD is equal to four, and here you get this from this equation minus two P. Ten minus four is six. Uh, you get the answer as P equal to one. So the price which the supplier gets is equal to P is equal to one. Price paid by consumer is P by T, right? So 1 plus 2 will be 3. It's not asked in the question, but you should just remember that there are two different values. Okay. Next, move on to the next part of the question. There's only one more part left, I think, which is the... Um, yeah, who pays tax in this scenario? So what happens here? Who's paying their tax in the scenario? Consumer. You're saying consumer. Okay. Anybody else? Somebody else is type. Somebody has said producer. Okay. So it's actually not the consumer, it's actually the seller. And the reason for that, uh, wait a minute, here. And the reason for that is because the quantity is fixed, right? So the way the, in this particular situation, the way it actually works out to be is that, um, hang on, I think one minute. Uh, I'll have to think a bit. Because, like I said, I have not solved this question. So, 
the answer correct answer it says is seller but i'm not sure if it is the seller so okay give me a moment i will need to think about this i will tell you the answer for this in the next class and i'll solve it also in the next class as to why it is seller and then there is the dead weight loss you have to calculate the dead weight loss so let's go back to our equation first do this part then we'll talk about seller and consumer um let's do this question nine right yeah so the simple equation for dead weight loss is uh, this qs is equal to four right so your supply curve is just this okay let's do the dead weight loss first because i think that is how you can actually explain why it is one or the other this is your demand function this is your supply okay demand is 10 minus 2 right 10 minus this is 4 now in equilibrium we uh, we know what happened in equilibrium right so okay yeah somebody has answered that is great uh, so this is the equilibrium value now what happened when we imposed the tax it is actually the it was the tax was levied on the consumer so what happened look at the equation here we are adding um, sorry we are subtracting something right so this equation becomes essentially 6 minus 2p so what is happening it is shifting the slope is remaining the same intercept is changing so okay this curve looks as if it is intersecting this at the value four but it's not just assume that this is correct okay this is the new curve this is a shifted curve okay now first of all what was before the whole uh, the tax imposition this was the consumer surplus right i'm just shading this part Now, what is the consumer surplus? So, suppose this is the new curve. This is the consumer surplus now, right? And so, what happens to the producer surplus in this case? Can somebody tell me what is what is the situation with the producer surplus? What happens to the producer surplus? Just tell me on the on the diagram what it is. <clears throat> How will we show? What, what normally what did we do? We had a curve, something like this. I'm drawing it just for <clears throat> diagrammatic representation. Something like this, right? What did we take? We took this part as the producer surplus. Now, in this case, what is happening? This vertical line is your demand function. Sorry, supply function. This is your supply function. The producer surplus is what? It's not changing. Right? Producer surplus is not changing. Only the consumer surplus is changing. Is that so? In this situation, this is this is the new. There is the white color. This is the new. Um, you know, after tax imposition. It's not the equilibrium per se. I'm sorry. It is a new equilibrium price in, in the face of taxes. The curve has shifted. Now, what is the price? What did we get the value as? One, right? One. Initially, it was three, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yes. So now this has shifted and quantity is still the same. Mm. Am I making a mistake? Yeah, I think I'm making a mistake somewhere. No, this is not. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me a second. Let me fix this diagram. This, the reason why I'm making this mistake is because this is intersecting it very low. And that's why it's looking zero, but it's not zero. So let's keep this, draw this back. Just make the shifted curve a little less. Sorry, just ignore what I said. I had made, my diagram was a bit misleading. That's why it was coming out all wrong. So now your new equilibrium is here, right? This was your initial equilibrium E. This is your new equilibrium. Let me delete this extra stuff here, which I had drawn. Actually, this is correct. This was not wrong. So let's leave this in place. Now let's see. Now let's talk about the um, consumer and producer surplus. This is the new bar. So now this has shifted. This is the consumer surplus. And where is the other color? Yeah. Now in this case, as you can see, there is again, at least from what I can see, there is no change in the producer surplus. And give me a moment to think, even I'm confused. Okay, I'm really sorry, but I have sort of lost thread of what I was doing. So let's end, end this here. I will come back and answer any as we are past, way past the time. I will post the solution for this in half an hour or something. I just want to solve this all over again. And I will explain this question first thing in the next class. I'm really sorry, but I'm, I just want to make sure I'm telling you something correct. And I need a few minutes to think before I answer. I, I read all the comments on the chat. And uh, what should we click? Yeah, these values are old. Just, uh, yeah, I marked it before, so. No, the P is here. Hang on, this is three, right? And this, no, the curve is not changing. What you're saying is not how it is. Ma'am, isn't that P should be at the equilibrium? That's the E, ma'am. Next to that should be the P. That's the equilibrium point. And the quantity four should be below that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I have marked it wrong on the diagram. Yes, yes. You are correct about that. I'm, I was talking about the shifted value. Yeah, this is. I thought you were saying something else. I thought you were saying that the price is the same. Price is changing. That's what I was pointing. Yes, I'm sorry. My diagram has gotten really messy. That's why I'm getting confused. I will just redraw the diagram and maybe check in one hour, half an hour or something. I will pose the solution again. Let me uh, just come back to you on this question. But I think other, other than this part, this confusion is arising because this supply curve is different. Let us let me just explain what happens if the supply curve is not vertical, which is, I think, the question you normally have to answer. So if this is the supply curve, then you can easily determine now, right? This is the producer surplus, right? This is where, uh, sorry, not this. This is the producer surplus. And this upper part is the uh, consumer surplus with a shifted curve. This is the consumer surplus, and this is the producer surplus. So the dead weight loss we are talking about is going to be what? This part is lost, as well as this part. This is going to be the dead weight loss. That is the question you were asking, right? What is the dead weight loss in the normal situation? In this situation, the question I picked is a bit tricky, and I didn't realize that I have kind of lost thread of this. So this, that is why it's slightly a funny situation because it is a inelastic uh, supply. But in the normal situation, this is going to be a dead weight loss. You can calculate this because you know all the values. So does that answer your question at least? The question which I have given is a bit tricky. We will come back to that. Uh, or have I confused you? It can happen sometimes. Ma'am, in this case, 
does the yeah. consumer surplus remain unchanged? In because which case? In the present scenario that we are talking no, about. No, don't talk about the present scenario. I will re-explain that from scratch in the next class. Because I will need to just calculate everything properly. And my diagram is not really helpful right now. So forget about the forget about this part, whatever we had taken. Just for the normal scenario, the question which I gave in the class, just forget about that for now. Just talk in the normal scenario, this is what happens. Is this part clear to you? Uh, so, yes, that is what I will. I will explain all the different scenarios in elastic, perfectly elastic, all of those. We actually also are out of time. I had actually planned to welfare. Yeah, what is your question on welfare? Ma'am, my question is when we impose taxes, ma'am. Yes. Before imposition of taxes, the total welfare is consumer surplus plus uh, producer surplus. Am I correct, ma'am? Yes. So, okay, you can take that as, I mean, in economics terms, welfare actually means something else. That's the reason why I asked you. Welfare can be defined in many different ways. But in our case, for the simple case, uh, where we are not talking about any kind of competition or monopoly, or we are not talking about anything Rawlsian or anything, then yes, in that simple case, you can take that welfare is consumer surplus plus producer surplus. Because welfare is in itself a very big subject of discussion. So that is why I asked you to specify what you meant by welfare. So in this um, simple scenario, you can assume consumer surplus plus producer surplus. Yes, next. What were you saying? What was your question about it? <laughs> 